Hello everyone, this is Evelyn Goodman. Greetings from Brainy Heart, from the heart of Shanghai. I'd like to have a very exciting interview with Andy Bregel. Andy is a general manager of a Swiss company uh, that is in the hydraulics industry for five years here in China. Andy has a lot to say about what we can learn from Chinese culture and how the speed is like here in China. Hi there, Andy. Welcome to Brainy Heart. Thank you for having me. From the heart of Shanghai, I'm really excited to have this interview with you today. Um, tell us about you a little bit so that the audience can, um, are, can, can hear who you are, what you do. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> no, um, yeah, I've been uh, living in China for a little less than five years. Um, I've been working pretty much with the same company for around um, 12 years now, building up different uh, countries, factories. Um, yeah, like uh, started with India, uh, which was very exciting. <laughs> After you've been to India, the rest of the world cannot shock you anymore. <laughs> okay. And uh, then I've been yeah, traveling a lot, uh, Brazil, Russia, Turkey, China, and China for uh, it's been over 11 years now on a regular basis mm -hmm. and then like uh, yeah roughly a little less than five years ago I moved to China um, what's your position here what do you do first I, I build up that company as a project I was a project manager uh, for this case and we had a local GM we realized that um, things with a local guy went horribly wrong so um, I was short-term asked whether I could imagine moving to China and uh, that's how I ended up in China. <laughs> okay. Um, your company is in a first tier or second tier uh, city in China? I, I would say it's third tier. Okay. Oh, even third tier? <laughs> it's a small little city with four and a half million people. For okay. China that's uh, not very large, but, uh, um, but it's actually for a personal uh, living situation it's uh, kind of close to Shanghai so within one hour you're in Shanghai with a fast train um, but it's it's very local there are not many expats uh, in the city and I'm the only foreigner in the company so yeah it makes it interesting and uh, what do you do exactly in your company your position man oh sorry uh, my position <laughs> I'm a I'm a general manager, so um, I take care of um, whole China or the company in China um, with sales all over China, um, taking care of the production side, uh, taking care of the sales, yeah. general manager stuff, basically taking care of everything. Okay, the holistic view uh, in this case, I think. Andy, um, China is a very steep market. Right, and what is the secret of uh, surviving in uh, such a steep and uh, on the other hand fast market? China is incredibly in the speed that they are developing. Um, also, we see that also from the competition side. Um, what our concept to success is, is that we have a very deep engineering understanding. Also, I'm not an engineer, I'm a business guy. But we are capable of designing a solution for the customer in the depth and understanding of hydraulics um, that the majority of the Chinese engineers, sorry to say that, is not capable of it. Um, I believe, you know, from my understanding or my technical depth is kind of shallow, but um, uh, you have to get creative in finding solutions yeah, for systems. And I see that so far the, the Chinese um, education system is kind of hindering it because if you, I believe if you put people in a situation where they are in school 12 years hammered, yeah, not being uh, challenged in, in rethinking or thinking outside the box, yeah, or you just uh, basically it's eat and eat or die yeah? so it's a very frontal kind of uh, teaching method then they go to university they have kind of like the same thing and then we are hiring them and then we are trying to think uh, think them outside of the box that does somehow not really work yeah? and this is for me uh, one of the reasons why we are still needed in china 
Well, we are needed on several levels, but for one, the depth of understanding this hydraulic system mm -hmm. and being able to redesign it. Um, I have not met many engineers from my customers that would be capable to design a system on a white sheet of paper. Okay. So they are basically just building up and checking whether one product is comparable to another product, but they don't have the in-depth understanding of how to design it on a white sp uh, spreadsheet. Oh, so you, you say that you know their their educational level. So namely that you know they are all university graduates, the people you work with. Yeah. However, they don't have the know-how uh, for um, that, that that they you know. I, I, I would not say it this way. I would say they definitely have the know-how. Mm -hmm. yeah. Chinese people are extremely smart. I think so. Yeah. Um, what we are, what we are saying, um, the creativity of thinking around um, a boundary. But this has many different. Uh, it's not so easy to explain it. Yeah. Because you also have to understand the position that these people are in. They might be actually able to do that or to understand that but their social pressure is too high the, the social risk is too high to do so because for the simple engineer if he is introducing a new solution and there is any problem with it he will lose his face and basically he's done mm. yeah so it's a cultural problem mm. on this one hand the, so the society what society expects from them and also on the other hand uh, what i said before is that really that thinking outside the the box, the creative trying to uh, solve problems, um, to play with it, because it's it's a game. You need to be, you know, if you were good in Lego, kind of like as a kid and building up new things, that would be the kind of understanding that you uh, would need for that. However, the education system nor the society is kind of um, challenging people this way. You have um, you have to understand also about China. Shanghai is not China, okay. Uh, Shanghai is very creative, you have a very creative uh, kind of people and um, in this traditional field of engineering this creativity for my feeling and that's my personal uh, feeling has not reached yet um, this type of uh, or this field of work yet. Okay, um, again but you know like in a short answer if you, if you want to just you know, like put it all together so what is the secret actually to survive in the Chinese market? You have to be flexible, mm -hmm. yeah, extremely flexible. You have to be very fast because um, your customers are, uh, let's call it, uh, no, that's a negative way. The Chinese market is very fast. Yeah? Um, the challenges that I deal with is that my customers do not have a production planning mm -hmm. for not even half a year. Yeah? So they are, uh, when they see that they run out of machines, they will start producing. This makes it very unpredictable in your own production mm. because you constantly need to react. You cannot plan, you need to react. Um, and that, the speed in China is extraordinarily important. Yeah. Next to quality and you know that's quality today is given. Yeah, it's, it's not such a thing anymore that you can say, I'm a German company, you know, I have good quality. That will not be your sales pitch. Yeah, yeah. You need to be fast, you need to be uh, solving their problems. I'm glad very you're much. saying that, yeah. Um, so this is the, the only chance you have to be successful in China, in my opinion. Then again, I'd like to you know, push it a little bit uh, uh, harder, if I may. So, namely, you work for an actually um, European company. As far as yep. I know, it's the Argo Hytos is a Swiss company. Are you guys fast enough uh, can cope with the Chinese market and their speed? Um, you know, I have to balance my slow European counters. <laughs> Sorry, saying that, Christian. No, um, it's uh, no, it's actually not. Uh, the only way I can survive is with uh, I have to have stock here because I depend on a lot of products that are, we are shipping in from uh, Europe. Um, I have to have stock here in order to provide that flexibility. I'm a lot faster in designing because I have my own design team here. Mm -hmm. So from that side, I'm a lot more flexible than our European companies. Normally in Europe, when you have projects, and this is very different to China these projects are like at least one year you know you start with a new product and um, it goes into a serious production so you have a, a very long uh, design phase and a planning phase here in china it's very different if your customer decides they want to adjust something on a running machine this is something you don't do in europe they will switch tomorrow if your concept works 
and it has a price advantage, then you're in tomorrow and you need to deliver tomorrow. You don't have this year of planning ahead in production and whatever. So it's a, it's a very different environment than uh, compared to Europe. Okay, it's, it's they're, they're a lot more, more productive. Challenging. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. in comparison to Europeans. Um, when, you know, what can we learn from them, actually? You know, what, because we say, or I'm observing as well, you know, this is another extreme here. But uh, we are also in Europe, in, in uh, Western world, another extreme. So uh, what can we learn in a, in a nutshell from them? From I, I think uh, number one for me is you can always learn something, no matter which country you go to. Even if you go to Bangladesh or India, you can learn something. Correct. Um, what we can learn from China is and what we definitely need to learn. And I'm putting this not just in the company, but in, in a larger scale. Um, number one is China for me is a phenomenon in the regards of how the country developed, the speed of development. And 10 years ago, they introduced fast trains. Today, they have 29,000 kilometers of fast train track. They're all, and fast train is 300. Now we're talking 350 kilometers per hour. Uh, we are very happy that we have now from Munich to Berlin, a fast track that goes 300 sometimes. Yeah, we can long. learn from them organization, mm -hmm. infrastructure, definitely infrastructure. The challenge for us is we cannot replicate China in that way because China is not a democracy. And the advantage of that is that they can do things and develop things that a democracy is not capable of developing. Excellent. But we good. really, really have to work on our infrastructure. Mm. Because, and that we can learn from China and the speed they are doing things. We are talking things to death over, um, uh, we talked, sorry, uh, briefly before that about uh, democracy and, uh, you know, I am not judging, I'm observing. So one of the things that does not work for me in our democracy today, well, there are a couple things, but um, we have such a long process. Let's take in Germany Stuttgart 21, yeah? my favorite one, or we're not even talking about your airport in Berlin. Um, Thanks. Yeah. We, brought it <laughs> <laughs> we brought it on the way in a democratic process. Whether that was good or whether that was bad, no worries. Now we have 1,000, let it, let it be 10,000 people yeah, in a city that has a couple of million people. And these guys are screaming out, oh, don't cut the trees down, don't cut the trees down. It, this is not a democracy. We brought it on the way in a democratic way that our democracy is designed to. And then we are listening to a couple of hundred people or a thousand people or 10,000 people. They made a vote, which our democratic system does actually not foresee. And it came out, nope. All the people, they really want it. It's just a couple of people screaming around and we are listening to them. That is not democracy. And the other thing is, what people from my understanding today or from my view don't understand about democracy, democracy is not just a right, it's also an obligation. You need to inform yourself. And I'm really sorry, Facebook does not count. Yeah? And all the social media, which is uh, highly influencing people today, does not count as information. Who sits down today and reads a solid article? You don't have this anymore. And this is why, for me, these uh, democracies are going a little bit into extremes, as we have seen with uh, several wrote of whatever you call it, Brexit, Trump. Um, yeah, this is why democracy is failing and why China is so far ahead. Because they just do things. You know. exactly. And they are and very discuss uh, way too long. And they are flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have seen this now uh, with Hong Kong. Yeah? Uh, okay, they saw they they hit a wall with that. They go around it. Yeah, and and they are very flexible in their uh, decisions. And they are having um, really what you have to understand about Chinese politicians is they are just the 0.02 percent of the best students that this country of one point three billion people has to offer. Correct, and they, they have a different sense and idea of, of investing. I mean, uh, where in Europe we, we prefer to sit on our money, I say all the time. And um, so saving, especially yeah. a typical German thing um, as well. So, um, and they just say money is there to invest it to the future. They're actually, um, in China is 
Chinese money is looking very much for investments. Um, they, the, still the number one is real estate. Yeah, um, you can see that that the prices are still rising, which are already crazy here in Shanghai. But um, they tried investing into stock when the market exploded a couple of years ago, so they failed on that. Um, and you can also see it in in companies. Um, if there is a new idea, you will have immediately three, four, five, six companies because they are all this capital is looking for for investments. Um, they are all financing the same idea, but in different kind of companies, um, which m makes it obvious that there is one or two surviving and the rest is dying. So you know, the hit rate is not very high here. But there's so much money that is looking for investment here. Mm. So it makes it very volatile and and very fast moving. And the the time to market here is a very crucial thing that we in uh, Europe are not very good at if you compare it with Chinese. They rather try out their product, uh, and if it fails, you know we we go on the on the go. We will adjust it. So very very different uh, market situation here. Yeah. Next question that I have is that is there a one size fit for success, and what is success for you? <laughs> Um, is there a one fit? No, I think um, in general, I think you need to be flexible and you need to be flexible in your mind and you need to be open. Ah, I mean, that means that actually yes. the, 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 the recipe or the idea for success is flexibility in the 21st century. Am I it's, it's, it's in general. allowed to put it that way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is to be, to be open, to be flexible, um, to, uh, to form to different uh, challenges uh, mm -hmm. that occur yeah, I don't know all the time, and I think for that it, it's a mindset thing for me. And also, if if I'm looking at younger generations, I think we need more exposure to different cultures. Um, like I was saying before, I rather I try to understand, not to judge. Um, we are very fast in in old good old Germany with judging, mm -hmm. yeah, especially if you go in to some countryside. <coughs> Sorry, um, I think we need to bring out our youth, expose them to different cultures, to get an understanding, to get rid of radical movements. Because only if you try to understand, you will, you know, you never fully understand. But you have an idea of, uh, you know, that there is something else out there. And I think that is, for me, in my belief, that's imperative. You have to to get as much input as you can. Yeah, but I mean, you know, what we observe, you're uh, also, uh, I'm a new German, I say all the time, and you're a real German who um, is uh, from the wonderful area Bodensee, uh, as far as I know, in Germany. Um, <coughs> back there, I mean, the German youth. So let me just do a nice uh, um, remark in there. So what can you say to German youth? Because uh, me living Berlin, between Berlin and Shanghai, I mean between Berlin or West, uh, Central Europe and, and Shanghai, um, I criticize this a lot that I see more and more this young generation, the assessments that I make with the German companies and uh, um, they are 25 to 35 year old young people and um, I mean, we are not that, we are also Generation X, I have to just say, I mean Andy and I. So, um, I see these these people not being open enough. They're just you know like they're not even accepting. I mean, I know a case, for example, that the executive, young executive, is, uh, is, is in Hanover, and he got a job offer in, in in the same company in Hamburg, and he says, "I can't leave because of my children." So, um, what do you say to that? To that? To to this word of phenomenon in Germany? So, are we flexible enough actually? And how long will it take us to? get flexible enough to co compete with the rest of the world because we are we are not doing very well actually at the moment uh, for me that's a, that's a um, how much time do we have now yeah, I mean, uh, it's a it's a very uh, deep going question and i think it's a very uh, interesting and valid question um, i think a lot about how i developed and how i see kids growing up here i think children are overprotected today they cannot develop their full potential and we are trying to make everything easy life is a competition there's no doubt in that I for example disagree when I was growing up um, I had to go to the military and I think that is a very good thing 
because <coughs> for your development not to be in charge of yourself uh, but to be challenged uh, in my case it was a little bit extreme nobody has to do that but we are not challenging enough anymore everything is so hard for the poor little children fall on your nose eat dirt it will build character as my US host dad used to say <laughs> so <coughs> from and that regard come too short? <coughs> I believe so Okay. I, mean, it's I, I don't have thing. I don't have children, yeah, uh, okay. but I see uh, my brother's children and uh, a lot of friends that have children, and I think we are very overprotective today, and we are trying to solve every conflict. And sometimes, um, what I also learn, you have to play out uh, yeah, some conflict. Yeah, they were saying in Germany, we uh, we are we are too Soft. much. Uh, uh, harmony bedurftig, yeah. yeah. So, and uh, I see this phenomenon more and more that you know, like especially German-speaking countries, we just avoid um, a, a a a healthy um, conflict culture. Yeah, this is this is basically okay. definitely missing, but not here. I hear and I see more and more. Um, next question that I have is that what would you recommend to a person who is just starting out just imagine those years of yours uh, you're just fresh from high school or, or uh, a levels and uh, and or you're fresh from university what would you recommend to a person um, who's at that stage uh, of their lives um, the only thing I can recommend is curiosity be curious about things um, if I would start at that level again I would definitely probably take one year just to travel the world or more if I could because the more I believe the more influences uh, or the more exposure cultural exposure you get the more your mind opens up um, what I learned for myself is questioning my value system because no matter where you grow up, you're uh, influenced by your value system. Everything you think is influenced by your value system. Open up your value system, you know, uh, and there's no right and wrong. Uh, don't be a judge, try to understand. Um, that would be my number one recommendation for anybody starting out, um, but it's never too late, so, you know. Yeah, you can start you can all over start. again all the time, <laughs> you're right. And we ask a final question to everyone in, in Brainy Heart. What is more important for you, Andy? Uh, having seen a lot of the world, I know you like traveling a lot, and um, having seen so many cultures, speaking a number of languages, um, you're an exceptional uh, person, definitely. And well, what is you. more important for you, um, heart or brain? Brain or heart? Yeah, you know, um, the, the funny thing is, uh, sometimes one side takes over and sometimes another side takes over. So sometimes I'm definitely impulsive uh, by heart, uh, driven by heart, um, and I'm trying to actually raise that part because I'm also too logical. Yeah, so my logical mind takes over and then... I think you studied economics, that's got something yeah. to do with that, yeah, okay. Yeah, I know, but in, in general I've always been this way, it has to be logic for me, yeah. Um, so, very rational uh, kind of mindset. Um, but I'm working on uh, bringing more heart into uh, it, because it's a lot more fun. <laughs> oh, great, this, is what, uh, this was going to be my the next question, like why is that so it's more fun, you say? You, you, you feel better afterwards, yeah, because in your subconscious, if you listen more what the heart is, the subconscious part, you feel better at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. trying to rationalize everything and, and killing your um, subconsciousness is not going to make you happy. Yeah. Thank you very much, Andy. This was Andy Briegel from Shanghai, from the heart of Shanghai with Brainy Heart. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. That was a great interview with Andy Briegel. Andy also highlighted the very important thing, namely the flexibility and the proactivity. The speed of our time is extremely important and it's not about only staying flexible, but also using one's logic. In Greek culture, we basically say that you have to uh, have two horses under control, compassion and passion horses, right? So if the compassion horse goes too far, then you just lose balance and so is when with the passion. And Andy, um, with his answers highlighted this very point wonderfully. Thank you very much and see you next time in Brainy Heart.
Thank you.